Yes, yeah, so welcome, welcome uh, everyone to this International Association for the History of Religions Women Scholars Network webinar. Uh, my name is Milda Alishauskene, and together with Amy Aloko, we are moderators of Women Scholars Network. And it's a pleasure today uh, for us to, to invite you to discuss uh, important uh, topics. Uh, we will be moderating this event together with uh, Amy, uh, because I'm also one of the presenters. <laughs> so Amy will be taking care of, uh, of the time. And Amy, would you like to say something at this moment? Sure. Welcome, friends. We're so happy to have you. Um, and we also anticipate that many others will be watching this um, once it's posted on YouTube. So we'll have other participants whose time zones don't work with this particular timing. Um, my name is Amy Alaco. I'm an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Elon University in North Carolina in the United States. I'm a South Asianist. I teach about South Asian religions, ethnography, and gender. Um, and I do my work in South India, um, mostly on contemporary Hindu rituals. Thank you, thank you, Amy. Uh, I will not, I will not introduce myself uh, uh, here because uh, um, my introduction will follow later before my presentation. Uh, so maybe just a few words before we start uh, this uh, this discussion. Uh, about the order, uh, how do we expect uh, us to work today? Uh, we usually uh, do not want to exceed more than 60 minutes because we know that it, it, uh, it is a bit uh, tiring to stay uh, longer by the computer. So today we would like to ask all the presenters to, to take up to 10 minutes uh, for their presentations, and then we'll continue with questions and answers uh, session. So we'll have half an hour for presentation and then half an hour for, for uh, discussion. And it is uh, really uh, a pleasure for me to introduce today uh, the speakers of this uh, webinar, which we entitled Intersecting Religion and Sexuality in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, webinar um, I had in mind. I think someone is uh, talking. Could we all just remember to mute our microphones unless we're ourselves speaking? Thanks so much. Yes. Uh, so uh, this uh, webinar and this topic uh, came to my mind uh, when we were listening to uh, Professor Melissa Wilcox. Uh, to her brilliant lecture on LGBTQ uh, religious identities. And uh, having in mind the, the uh, split in Europe and European continent uh, concerning the attitudes uh, towards, the, uh, towards the LGBTQ uh, people, I thought it would be interesting to uh, invite uh, uh, women scholars who have been recently working on the topic to share their insights and then to discuss uh, why actually we have this uh, uh, division in Europe between Western and Central and Eastern European uh, countries uh, concerning the attitudes, what is in the cultures or societies that, uh, that uh, leads to, this, uh, to these divisions. So I'm re really very happy that uh, my invitation was accepted by Dorota Hall from Poland, by Anna Maria Basauri Zuzina from Ukraine. And I also thought that I might also contribute to this uh, uh, with my insights from uh, Lithuania. So our first speaker today will be Dorota Hall. And Dorota is a cultural anthropologist and sociologist. She is also associate professor at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, uh, Polish Academy of Sciences, and president of the International Study of Religion in Eastern and Central Europe Association. She has studied religion and sexualities in Poland since 2011. And in 2016, she published uh, a book 
searching for a place, LGBT Christians in Poland. However, the book unfortunately is in Polish. She has also published in English in various academic journals and edited volumes. And certainly this is more accessible uh, than, than the book itself. So Dorota, uh, welcome. And uh, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I would uh, stop uh, sharing now uh, this announcement okay. and ask you if you would like to uh, share your PowerPoint you. or will you be talking just? I, I'm going to, 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 to talk because I have some like, like more or less loose thoughts. It's not the uh, uh, hard data that I'd like to share with you. So, so maybe it will be better just like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Milda. And thank you very much for inviting me to this discussion. <laughs> so, uh, as you mentioned, ten, it's 10 years ago that I started to conduct a research project on religion and non-heterosexuality in Poland. And uh, what I studied, I studied media coverage of issues related to religion and non-heterosexuality. I conducted biographical interviews with LGBT Christian believers. And I carried out a participant observation in a group self-defined as LGBT Christians. So after closing the project, I have followed developments related to religion and sexual and gender non-normativity in Poland, though not in a systematic manner. So today I will be drawing on my findings, but my main focus will be on pointing out a few issues that I find most relevant uh, for a broader reflection on religion and non-heterosexuality in Central and Eastern Europe. <clears throat> so yes, first let me refer to the difference in public acceptance of homosexuality between uh, Central Eastern European and Western European countries. Um, questions about homosexuality asked in surveys are never just about homosexuality, right? <laughs> they are entangled in public perceptions of homosexuality as a phenomenon uh, closely linked to specific values and specifically situated in relation to the idea of the nation. So in many regions outside of the Western core, including in Central and Eastern Europe, homosexuality tends to be perceived as an alien element of the national culture. In our region, societal attitudes towards homosexuality have much to do with the perception of the European Union as pro-gay, right? And the acceptance of homosexuality has much to do with the acceptance of the cultural dominance of the Western Europe. It was on the eve of uh, 2004 European Union enlargement to the East that sexual rights in Poland, and I think it's as, uh, the same as in, in, uh, elsewhere in Central and Eastern Europe, they provided a platform for expressing competing political views. So the pro-European liberal articulations clashed with Eurosceptic visions that used the image of the homosexual, uh, uh, homosexual as the other uh, threatening the nation's sovereignty and national values. So uh, in many countries of our region, these values are closely linked to religion. In Poland, it's Roman Catholicism. Mm. So the right wing protectors of religion and the nation stood against cosmopolitan liberals. And well, the next years showed that the liberals who ruled the country for more or less 10 years after Poland had joined the European Union, the liberals didn't do much for supporting sexual minorities. Still, what they hugely invested in was referencing anti-gay articulations to ridicule the right wing's backwardness and parochial irrelevance. And this self-orientalizing vision of the native society as backward is also known to other Central and Eastern European countries. It draws on typical for the region historical templates that oppose the enlightened cosmopolitan intellectuals to the lower social strata characterized as xenophobic and in need of education. During the post-communist economic transformation, the paternalistic approach of the traditional intelligentsia to the people was adapted by the emerging upper middle class uh, composed of managers, bureaucrats, and other winners of the systemic change who established themselves as pro-European liberals. So what we have in Poland now is the right-wing populist reaction. 
The right wing has been empowered by international developments resulting from the 2008 economic crisis, the dismissal of neoliberal projects, and the enhancement of populist, uh, populist discourses. The right wing populist fight with liberal and cosmopolitan elites has grown in support significant enough to bring right wing populists to power. And under their rule, anything reproached by the liberals as backward has translated into claims made from the politically privileged position. The ruling politicians, they reclaim their perceived backwardness by exposing their commitment to the image of the nation laced with Roman Catholic religion. They also employed the rhetoric of war with so-called gender ideology, promoted also by the Polish church, with, which targets, among others, sexual minorities, and is a part of a transnational anti-liberal, uh, uh, anti-neoliberal uh, uh, political agenda. The rule of right-wing populists in Poland have encouraged the proliferation of anti-gender NGOs and homonegative articulations by officials of the Roman Catholic Church and politicians at the highest level. So homosexuality or societal attitudes towards homosexuality are strongly entangled in political struggles typical for the region or a given country context. These struggles are connected to transnational developments, to the semi-peripheral position of the region, to insecurity related to the West European cultural and economic dominance, to, um, I don't know, tendencies to link the idea of the nation with a specific religion and uh, to problems related to self-orientalization. The geopolitics of all of this is probably even more complicated in Ukraine, uh, which is caught up between the European and the Russian empires. Anyway, my answer to the question, uh, how much national churches contribute to the formation of public acceptance of homosexuality in our countries, is they probably contribute a lot, but they never act alone. Their contribution is allowed or withheld by a multitude of political factors, and it should be seen as a part of a broader picture, right? I, I, I wonder what would be your thoughts <laughs> on it. Now, from the Polish perspective, uh, let me briefly comment on issues related to gay Christian organizing and to living religion and non-heteronormativity. In Poland, we have a nationwide community self-defined as LGBT Christians, uh, composed mainly of uh, Roman Catholic believers, which is a direct consequence of the fact that uh, um, that around 90% of Poles adhere to the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the community works for um, works as a support group and uh, calls for the revision of the Roman, Roman Catholic Church's standpoint of, on LGBT issues. It also builds alliances with Catholics many years away from the dominant attitudes of Polish church officials. Uh, LGBT Christians in Poland uh, implement mainly an identity-based strategy, which has its limitations, of course, but seems typical for gay Christian groups elsewhere. What I think may be interesting for us uh, is that Polish LGBT Christians quite closely cooperate with secular queer organizations, despite obvious differences. I wonder how it is in Lithuania and Ukraine, and if this cooperation and solidarity is typical for Poland, which is predominantly Roman Catholic and the secular uh, activism recognizes limitations of purely secularist approach, or it is typical also for other countries where homophobia is strongly politicized. Hmm? Next, um, the question about constructing religious identities, it was posed in the invitation to this panel. Um, my research shows that LGBT Christians employ very, various individualistic attitudes when combining their sexuality with religion. For instance, they reinterpret the Bible, they rely on positive personal experience of the sacred, uh, or they cultivate the image of the loving God. Still, there are limits to their religious individualism. They are visible, for instance, when we consider denominational affiliation. Um, as a rule, LGBT Christians in Poland stay with Roman Catholicism, despite the church's strong homonegative attitude and the fact that other Christian denominations are slightly more open to sexual and gender non-normativity. In my view, this is related to the fact that during their childhood and adolescence, LGBT Christians were engaged in various in-church activities, and today they recognize the church um, 
the the liturgy, the the songs, icons, the religious practice as their own. They don't want to change it for something different. Probably this has slightly changed recently because of the strong anti-LGBT drive of the church. But 10 years ago, at the time of my study, when I met someone who converted to a different denomination, it appeared the person was raised up in a multi-denominational family, right? I wonder about the loyalty to the first church in Lithuania and Ukraine and whether we can identify any patterns typical for our region, perhaps related to the fact that there is little religious pluralism in our countries. So this would be another thing. And the last remark now. Usually when we ask ourselves uh, questions such as how LGBT individuals construct their religious identities, we tend to essentialize gender and sexual identities uh, of our research participants. I think we should problematize them. And our region with its specific sexual history makes a great laboratory for such problematization. Um, in Poland, it was only at the time um, of Poland's accession to the European Union when the gay subject position uh, was firmly established in the public discourse. Before, many of those who followed their homoerotic desire were not inclined to see their sexual non-normativity in identity terms. And I think this allows us to delve deeper into intricacies of combining sexuality with religion and the personal level to identify problems specific for the past and for the present day, and perhaps also to see the difference in how religion and sexual or gender non-normativity are lived by those of older and younger generations. Uh, again, I wonder if you have any thoughts on it. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I'm looking forward to comments by uh, Anna Maria and Milda and, uh, and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorota. That was really very insightful. And I see applauses and uh, we will continue to the next presentation and, uh, and then we'll have uh, at the end uh, uh, the discussion. So Anna Maria Basauri Zuzina is another our presenter in today's webinar. Anna Maria holds PhD in religious studies. Uh, she was born in Kiev in Ukraine uh, in 2000, from 2009 to 2021. She has been working at the Department of Cultural Studies at the National Pedagogical Drogam, Dro, Dragomanov University, sorry. And now I know that Anna Maria is in the United States for a while. And she has been also very actively involved in the uh, Youth Association for the Study of Religions in Ukraine. Uh, and she attains membership in other organizations and also translates religious texts from English into Ukrainian. Her research interests include Judaism, scientific atheism, gender and religion. Anna Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, uh, for this beautiful invitation and uh, introduction and for this invitation to participate in such a renowned um, um, seminar because for me it is a real honor to to participate in Women Scholars Network right from the feminist point of view and uh, to present uh, the research that the workshop for the academic study of religion has started recently. Um, I should say first of all that um, I agree with uh, um, the majority of what Dorota said, but now I will focus a little bit on the research that we are conducting right now. And I would like to make some kind of small presentation of what we have at the moment. And then maybe I, in the discussion part, I can also comment on the ideas and questions that Dorota raised. So I will share my screen if you, um, if you allow me. I have a few... Oh my God, mm -hmm. I have few slides here. I always make slides because it is easier for me. <laughs> could you, um, could you please second. make a slideshow? Yes, uh, I yes, I'm be, doing uh -huh. it right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the same time, I need to see my... Ah, so you can't see, um, I cannot share and, what, and read my text at the same time, right? Uh, I, I am afraid no. This oh is the God. limitations of the, of the mm -hmm. Zoom. <laughs> okay, so then it will be 
like this. I'm sorry, but I haven't printed my my text. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, yes. Do you think it would be possible to close this format background? Maybe then the slides would be larger. Format background. How should I do it? Uh, there is X on the right side up upper. So in that side gray bar, yeah, yeah. you got it. Good. Now it is okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the starting point of our research is the idea that uh, Dorota also said that um, every person has uh, his or her unique identity, which consists of many elements. It develops in time and changes depending on new social circumstances the person experiences. In the study of religion, the term religious identity is sometimes used, although we cannot find an entry, for example, for this notion in the Encyclopedia of Religion, like a main resource, <laughs> like the first. Um, in their recent book, Religion in 50 Words, uh, Aaron Hughes and Russell McCutcheon, for example, they state, they argue that identity studies highlight marginalized groups that are often overlooked in scholarships by aiming to register their experience, their distinctiveness and their worth. And this is exactly what our research has aimed, because um, the research is aimed at studying of two such marginalized groups, the people who one day found themselves on the intersection of religious identity and gender identity. These identities, of course, overlap, at times conflicting with each other, in times contesting, and uh, sometimes even living peacefully. But uh, identity we rather uh, see as not static, not essential, but a developing attribute. The groups that our research uh, studies. Uh, it, these are feminists and LGBT people who identify themselves as being religious or believing in God in the present or in the past. And these two groups are marginalized both by their religious communities and Ukraine, as well as secular feminists and LGBT communities to some extent. We are aware that these two groups have distinctive experiences of combining these aspects of their identities because homosexuality is much stronger stigmatized in religious communities than feminism is. But we are also aware that these two groups do exist in Ukrainian society, although the churches on one hand and secular feminist and LGBT communities on the other prefer not to notice them and to exclude their problems from their agenda. Both feminists and LGBT people use various strategies of reconciliation of their religious beliefs with their values of equality in the case of feminists and their sexuality in the case of LGBT people. Therefore, the goal of our research is to study the personal experience of present or former believers who identify themselves as being LGBT and or feminist, uh, LGBT people and or feminists. Just a few words about the situation, general situation in Ukraine, uh, what it is for everybody to understand the field where we work. The general population of Ukraine is estimated as more than 41 million people. And according to some sociological dat data that we have, in 2020, 67.9% of Ukrainian population identify themselves as believers. At the same time, 16% of these people can define their confessional belonging. So the others are not so sure about what confession they belong to. 48% uh, claim to visit religious communities for religious holidays only, and 22% uh, claim to visit churches every week. So this is a big discussion in Ukrainian religious studies about whether we really can say that 67% of Ukrainian population is religious, to what extent they are religious and so on, but we do not touch it in our research. Uh, concerning the confessional uh, division, 61% of those people who identified themselves as believers claim to be Orthodox Christians, 10% Greek Catholics, and nine ordinary Christians. We don't have any statistical data on the quantity of feminists in Ukraine, and we also don't have any statistical data on LGBT people. But grounding on the research in Western countries, we assume that homosexual people constitute from 2 to 10 percent of Ukrainian population. But we know um, 
very little about them. And we also do not know any numbers about people who are feminists and LGBT, and at the same time, they uh, identify themselves as religious or uh, believing. So beginning June 2000, um, 2021, the workshop of the Academic Study of Religion, this is a new name of the organization that Milda um, uh, mentioned. Um, it is an NGO which unites religious studies scholars, is carrying out the research called Combining the Incompatible. And this research, research is jointly funded, found, funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The team which is involved in research is not very big, but at the same time, um, quite big enough to make a uh, very good research. And most of uh, the team is here present at this uh, seminar. It's Ksenia Gurji, Irina Kaplan, Linia Pedgorna, Konstantin Polishchuk, and Olena Strelnik. As I have mentioned before, the goal of the research is to study the personal experiences of believers who identify themselves as being feminists and or LGBT people. Now we are in the middle of the second uh, part of our research. We're interviewing present or former believers. Uh, believers. Um, we define the research to be uh, qualitative, not quantitative. Therefore, we aim at interviewing from 30 to 40 people, women, men, non-binary people who are 18 years old and older. The selection of respondents is based on the criteria of self-identification. The potential respondents should identify the, themselves with a certain religion at present or in the past, or to be feminists and or LGBT people at present or in the past. We use the snowball sampling, trying to reach people from various gender and age groups, as well as from various ge geographical regions of Ukraine. Anyway, as we see it now, the studied groups are quite difficult to reach out. The main research method is deep semi-structured interviews conducted online and offline. Our research is work, work in progress, as um, therefore we don't have results yet, but we can see some general tendencies, which I would like to call today preliminary observations. So far, we have conducted 13 interviews with 10 women, two men, and one non-binary person. The youngest respondent is uh, about is 21 year old, the oldest 42. All th 13 respondents have higher education. Um, six respondents are from Western Ukraine, other respondents represent other uh, parts of Ukraine, and one now studies in Great Britain even. Twelve of the respondents claim to be feminists. Uh, one um, respondent is homosexual man, male, one homosexual female, one bisexual female, and one non-binary person. Talking about their religions, four of them identify themselves as being believers of Greek Catholic Church. We have three Orthodox Christians, two Catholics, two Muslim, one Protestant, but in the past, and one agnostic. Um, next slide. Yes. Oi. What happened? Can you see my last uh, we slide? We see white, uh, oh, no. white screen. Uh -huh. Now? Yes, we can see. Great, thank you. Sorry. Um, okay, so about observations. <laughs> it is extremely difficult to find homosexual males to talk to. We have three cases when we turn to such people, but they refuse to participate in the study. And we suggest that this happens because of the heavier stigmatization of homosexual men in religious communities, which sometimes happen to be more tolerant towards homosexual women. Although the feminist community is not so well institutionalized institutionalized in Ukraine as LGBT communities are, it is easier to find feminist respondents than LGBT people. We suggest that this happens because of the more tolerant attitude towards feminists than towards homosexual people in Ukrainian society. For example, according to JFK Ukraine survey, 40% of respondents wouldn't like their neighbors to be homosexuals. High level of education of all the respondents can be the result of the snowball sampling when people recommend for interview their friends who have the same level of education. On the other hand, we tend to suggest that people with higher level of education are more prone to reflect on their worldview and values, religious and secular, trying to reconcile their competing identities. 
the interviewed feminist respondents tend to divide into two groups. Finally, uh, the first group uh, where people finally quit their religion, uh, which they used to believe in, and this is what Dorota also mentioned. Yes, they used to believe in because they were brought up in this religious tradition. And then they, when they realized that it doesn't correlate with their um, feminist beliefs, they quit the religion. Um, and the second group continues to be a part of a certain community looking for feminist interpretation of the sacred text or subduing with the restrictions toward women in the church. You can see on the second slide, I will not read it, but you can see at this slide. Oh no, you can't see it. Unfortunately. Okay. Nevertheless, <laughs> we have two very beautiful quotes from our respondents about the, like the examples of these two uh, attitude, uh, uh, example of the second group of feminists. And the last but not the least, uh, uh, when we elaborated the general idea of our research, we clearly understood that no one in Ukraine has ever studied religious feminists and LGBT people. We are fully aware that our study is very important for the development of the field of equal rights for women and LGBT people within religious communities, and it will promote reflections on the topic in broader society. But we were really surprised that our respondents emphasized this, the importance of being heard. They do not feel comfortable about speaking publicly about their beliefs in both religious and feminist or LGBT communities, but they agreed to participate in our research because they wanted other people within the church or outside of it to be aware of their existence, of the outdated position of these churches towards feminists and LGBT people. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. And I'm also looking for the discussion about uh, um, uh, our three countries and the situation with uh, LGBT and uh, religion here. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. That was wonderful. We now have our third presenter and it's my pleasure to introduce my fabulous co-coordinator of the Women Scholars Network, doc Dr. Milda Alishkine. She's professor in the Department of Political Science at the Viatis Magnus University in Lithuania. Her research interests include gender and religion, religion and state relations, religious diversity and new religions. Milda is the author of more than 40 social scientific research papers on religion in contemporary Lithuania and the Baltic states. And she's contributed to many studies on social exclusion of minority religions and on the process of secularization in Lithuania. She's currently leading two research projects, one on the social inclusion of minority religions in contemporary Lithuania, and another on religion and gender equality in the Baltic states and Norway. Thanks, Milda. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, so much. Uh, and thank you also to, to my colleagues, both Dorota and Anna Maria, who already raised very important issues, which I hope um, uh, I will also touch upon during my presentation. Uh, today, I thought I will uh, quickly introduce you with the research that I have been carried out, uh, carrying out uh, last uh, few years. And uh, I have interviews and, and survey. But first of all, um, this interest uh, into this um, topic uh, started with uh, with uh, some uh, social issues uh, uh, that were happening in the country, and uh, here are here is some kind of outline uh, um, what has been happening with the LGBTQ uh, plus individuals in contemporary Lithuania uh, since the Declaration of Independence in the nineties. Uh, there has been there has been. Uh, definitely a uh, very important um, uh, historical uh, events related to the adoption of the liberal constitution, uh, to the uh, um, membership of uh, the country within Council of Europe, which came uh, together with decriminalization of homosexuality. And I would like to remind you that Lithuania was a part of the Soviet Union 
uh, one of the republics of Soviet Union uh, together uh, with the Ukraine. While Poland was not a, a, a part of uh, Soviet Union, but was rather a, a country of uh, uh, this uh, communist Ariel, as we as we see it. So Lithuania uh, introduced the criminalization of homosexuality in 1993, and it seems that until the EU membership in 2004, uh, all the development uh, uh, was pro-LGBTQ rights um, implementation. However, uh, since the since the membership within EU European Union, we can see that there is a, a certain type of backlash and one of the one of the key events happened in 2009 when the law and protection of minors from impact of public information was uh, adopted and the restriction of propaganda of homosexual bisexual relations and polygamy was introduced back then although the law is there uh, practically we don't see its um, implementation but it has never been also uh, recalled uh, then uh, I think important to see that the the uh, Baltic Pride has been happening already four year, four times in Vilnius, the capital of of uh, Lithuania. There has been certain initi some initiatives um, with the coming out uh, um, of LGBTQ plus individuals in Lithuania. Uh, Another turning point was in 2019 when the Constitutional Court declared that same-sex marriages that were conducted abroad between Lithuanian and non-Lithuanian citizens should be legalized in Lithuania, although uh, the same-sex marriage is not um, a question being discussed yet. Uh, we are still uh, as a society in the point where same-sex partnership has been has been discussed a lot and because of the idea that same-sex partnership can be introduced together with, with um, uh, partnership of, of uh, different uh, sexes, uh, the partnership for different sexes is not introduced as well. So there is this um, there is this um, resistance uh, uh, towards uh, towards uh, partnership idea in general. The last year, the, actually this year, twenty twenty one, was also very very um, had a lot of of different events. We saw the uh, for, for the first time Pride, uh, which uh, happened in. Uh, not a capital city in Kaunas, which is the largest, the second largest city. So we see that there is a kind of a attempt to to move beyond the boundaries of the capital city, city which is which is uh, of course a, a kind of multicultural and liberal uh, uh, space and more friendly for for LGBTQ uh, uh, individuals. A uh, very recent event is that uh, there has been initiative to start the, uh, the non-governmental organization uh, called Mothers for LGBTQ plus uh, uh, children. At the same time, one more thing, which I think very important to mention, having in, uh, to mention in, in this context of the research that I want to introduce you, is the very recent publication of translation to Lithuanian of James Martin's book, Building a Bridge. This is a, a book written by a Jesuit priest. Uh, uh, he's, in, he's uh, discussing um, the possibility of a dialogue between Roman Catholic Church, uh, Church and LGBTQ plus individuals. And this, this has been a, a big, a big um, issue in, in the country and a lot of discussion, public discussions have been, uh, has started due to this uh, publication of the book and, and um, discussions around it. Now, uh, uh, another an, another um, idea that I also wanted to share with you is, of course, what what um, uh, Dorota has also mentioned that uh, we have uh, a certain attitude in uh, Central and Eastern European countries towards um, uh, homosexuality and same-sex marriages, and as you see. In this slide, the LGBTQ plus group uh, in Lithuania 
falls into the um, five most disliked social groups together with Roma people, Muslims, people with mental illnesses and refugees, meaning that uh, the Fenian population does not want to live in the neighborhood, does not want to, to work together with LGBTQ plus uh, individuals. And also at the same time, we see that um, uh, these uh, attitudes have been, have been changing a bit uh, and the changes are usually related to the generation uh, changes. And uh, we see, of course, the, the difference between the attitudes uh, among uh, uh, population living in the urban and, and rural uh, territories as well. And also I wanted to show, share with you this slide, which actually maybe I should have shown it to, to you in the, in the beginning, which um, uh, actually refers to the idea of, of that I had uh, before, before inviting my colleagues to talk about it, that we see actually this, uh, this division between Western uh, Europe and Central and Eastern European countries related to the to the attitudes towards uh, homosexuality. But of course, the, the idea that, that I would like to, to discuss with you is whether uh, who is constructing these, uh, these attitudes and how they are seen by LGBTQ plus individuals themselves. So uh, for the research, we had a few hypotheses and questions because this is both quantitative and qualitative research. So we expected that LGBTQ plus um, religious uh, religiosity would particularly be belonging. Beliefs and practices would be rather chosen than inherited one. Uh, we expect that uh, religious identities would be constructed individually, more of the pluralistic orientation and more private than public. We also were expecting that LGBTQ plus individuals would um, have uh, critical uh, stances towards the role of religion in the public and that they would tend to eliminate religion from the public sphere. And we also had questions for, for the interviews. So the, the research that we conducted included the online survey with LGBTQ plus um, community. Uh, it, um, it was conducted in October 2017. Uh, I'm very grateful for Lithuanian Gay League who, who helped us uh, to, to uh, conduct this survey and they disseminated an uh, invitation to participate in this survey. We managed to get uh, 266 respondents who answered our, our questionnaire. And you see the, the profile, we can see that uh, uh, the dominated group within, within sample were women. Every third was a man. We had also a minority of uh, transgendered individuals who contributed, majority were urban citizens. And uh, they also majority had uh, higher education. And we also uh, invited the, um, the respondents if they would like to contribute to this uh, survey to to write to us and to participate in the interviews. And we, we managed to get uh, 12, uh, 12 informants for our interviews. So what did we find? Uh, uh, I will not, uh, will not show any data, but uh, I would rather, uh, rather go directly to the kind of uh, uh, observations. So our hypothesis were only partly confirmed uh, because of the existing division uh, um, of LGBTQ plus religious identities, which allow speaking about contesting existing boundaries between religious heterosexuals and non-religious homosexuals in Lithuania. We started our research and we, were, uh, we faced the criticism, first of all, from LG, LGBTQ plus uh, organizations because they thought that the uh, um, majority of their members were not religious and they uh, had no uh, issues related to their religious identities. So what we found is certainly that there are uh, religious individuals among LGBTQ plus um, um, participants of our research. We found that every third of the, of the survey of the respondent uh, was considering himself herself uh, religious. 
so we found the diversity of religious identities and uh, uh, like devoted religionists, for instance, the, the, the one who was socialized into Roman Catholicism, who was uh, continuous uh, believing and practicing and searching for reconciliation of, uh, of religious LGBTQ uh, religiosity with uh, Roman Catholicism, the dominating uh, uh, religious uh, organization and um, faith in the country. Traditionalists were those who were socialized into Roman Catholicism. They were believing, criticizing Roman Catholic Church and searching for one's place in religion. So they were staying in the religion. Uh, there were converts who were socialized into Roman Catholicism, but they were believing, but conducted public apostasies and left Roman Catholic Church. Public apostasies, um, we saw since 2010 uh, as an issue that has been raised in the social media and um, elsewhere. Apostates, the ones who were socialized into Roman Catholicism, currently they are non-believing and they have left the Roman Catholic Church, but it was not a kind of uh, public uh, uh, leaving of, of the church. And secularists, those who had no religious socialization, who consider themselves atheist or agnostics, agnostics and criticize Roman Catholic Church. Uh, as for theorizing what we have found, we, we think this is a kind of a reflexive identity that dominated among research participants. They were reflected on the, reflecting on the role of religion in their parents' and grandparents' families. Uh, they were also reflecting on the role of religion, particularly Roman Catholic Church in the public, involvement of clergy in political decisions. So we were raising a question about the privatization of religion. Uh, we also found that there was, has been a lot of criticism of religion and particularly based on personal encounters with priests and religious people. Some of our informants were, were sharing in the narratives their experiences with, with homosexual priests as well. Uh, we also found that Roman Catholic Church in Lithuania was demonstrating the uh, position of denial, denial towards LGBTQ plus individuals. And uh, uh, since 2000, the, the year 2000, Roman Catholic Church was an important actor in the public promoting traditional family values together with other non-governmental organizations. Uh, around the 2017, the first initiatives from Franciscan order to provide safe space for LGBTQ plus parents in the church and also LGBTQ plus uh, uh, individuals um, has started. Sorry, I am running too quickly here. And we also see that there has been a fragmentation concerning LGBTQ plus rights within Roman Catholic community itself and that there are certain attempts for social inclusion of this uh, group. Uh, they started uh, during the field work and continues up to nowadays. So I will stop uh, sharing now because I think the time is running very quickly. Um, so just uh, my final remarks would be that um, differently than in Poland, uh, LGBTQ plus individuals in Lithuania they do not have any uh, organization that would unite them and help them to, to cope with the Roman Catholic Church hegemony, uh, even also in this question. And um, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Milda, and Dorota, and Ana Maria. We're so grateful for your presentations. Um, I know that we are running a little short on time, but only because of the richness of the comments that were offered to us. And so I would welcome any questions that folks might want to add into the chat or for you to just use the raise hand function. And then we would invite you to unmute yourself and just verbalize your questions. So inviting initial questions for any of the presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. So I don't I don't see any hands yet. Uh, so maybe maybe I would like uh, uh, to start with uh, with my own question, because <laughs> I think I think really we we saw some of the common trends and in in this uh, research that we are all conducting, and. Um, 
My question would be a very broad one. Uh, so what do you think is in this context uh, that we are talking about? How much uh, this um, is related to the, to the historical uh, context where we are coming from uh, concerning the attitudes that we see uh, towards LGBTQ plus um, individuals in our societies, but also in our in uh, dominating religious organizations. Dorota, would you would you like to start, maybe? Yes, thank you very much. Well, only shortly, I can see another uh, question from from Rosalind Hackett. Um, uh, yeah, yeah I, I have an, the impression that I spoke about it exactly. I address exactly this issue. Like for me, it, it's what is in our content it, it, uh, context is. Uh, is our semi-peripheral position, I would say. It's, it's, it's really, it, it uh, tells us a lot. And when we, when we think deeper about it, uh, it, it really it translates so much to the attitudes to, towards uh, LGBT people and also to, uh, to how religion is involved in all of this. So, so, so I think that my answer, my simple answer would be like that. Is the, it, it's the, the question of the core and periphery and this uh, semi-peripheral position in the European mm -hmm. Union, especially. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anna Maria, what, what about Ukraine? Uh, before we, we give uh, the floor to Rosalind question. Yes, just a very small uh, answer. Um, the historical background is really important. And it seems to me that um, Ukraine differs from Poland and Lithuania in this case, in this attitude towards LGBT people, because the dominant religion is Orthodox, not Roman Catholicism. As we see in our research, um, Greek Catholics or Roman Catholics, they are more eager to talk about these questions because it seems to me that the general position of the church is um, such that the church reflects on um, feminism and on uh, homosexuality, right? When we turn to the Orthodox Church, the situation is a little bit different because or it seems to me that Orthodox Church doesn't want even to think about such things, right? So it doesn't, they do not want to accept the fact that there are feminist believers and there are LGBT people. So this is also a problem because we were in our research, we wanted to find more Orthodox Christians, but as we see, and we also turn to some um, people who we think are uh, Orthodox feminists or Orthodox LGBT, people, but they uh, refused to talk to us uh, again. So this is also a, a slight difference in this case, but the general negative attitude of the uh, Ukrainian population towards homosexual people is evident. Yes, unfortunately. Thank you, Anna Maria. I will give a floor now to Rosalind. She has a question probably. Yes, I do. Hello everyone. And I'm just, um, um really uh pleased and stimulated to learn about all this research in in a part of the world that i know so little about and so i i, I want to thank you for all the research that you're doing and i'm of course grateful to the women's scholars network for for showcasing this so i you know i i think this is just very positive and i hope that perhaps uh, there are other neglected parts of the world if you like or that like where you're doing you're working away there and we just really don't know so much about it so we're sort of getting the uh much more texture much more information anyway my question actually is to milda primarily but others might be want to chime in on this i noted that you are operating primarily with uh sort of institutional categories right in, in terms of uh religious organizations but and and so you talked about uh, the i like that concept of you know what's the influence of religious socialization in all of this but what about those who are more 
um, who are more involved in or leaning towards uh, non-religion or sp the secular sacred or the sacred secular or, or spirituality, does that uh, have any bearing? Uh, is this something that you just decided not to focus on, like that you, you're focusing on the main religious organizations or the atheists, but w wouldn't there be people uh i mean women especially are often drawn to the category uh or the the, the possibilities of of spiritual communities uh, is that a factor at all in your research uh on, on these important topics thank you thank you rosalind uh i think it's a very good question but uh, from uh, from the sample that i have uh, i came up to this kind of uh, uh, types that i found uh, and uh, and of course uh, um, i think this is also something that we need to talk when we speak about uh, the role of religion in general in this particular part of the of the world because um, uh, the spirituality phenomenon is uh, is uh, seem to be um, rather marginal, and it's even marginal, more marginal when it comes to LGBTQ uh, plus sample. In a sense that, in general, we are facing here a cultural group uh, that has. Uh, has, which is less religious than the total population. I've, I've mentioned a bit that uh, LGBTQ plus uh, sample that I managed to reach uh, shows that every third of, of uh, my respondents were saying they were religious. Now, if you think about the common population, that would be 77% of Lithuanians would say that they are Roman Catholics. And uh, around the same, the same uh, number would say that they are religious, meaning that we are facing here a very, a very specific uh, cultural group uh, with this with this sample. So we found some some of the of our respondents who were saying that they are rather uh, concerning uh, they considering themselves rather spiritual than religious. Uh, but uh, but they were um, so few that uh, I could not I could not uh, generalize on on those on those cases so far. But um, I hope that if research continues, I will I will be able to 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 find uh, more of this uh, of this uh, type. Thank you. Uh, I see that we have a question from uh, Melissa Wilcox, and. Uh, and she has to leave, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, Dorota has been has been uh, uh, speaking a bit about this in her in her uh, presentation about the about the actors who are influencing the uh, the activists, and maybe maybe I will read shortly. Uh, so uh, the question is for all the speakers. Uh, Melissa says that in her limited exchanges with LGBT uh, religious activists in East, Eastern Europe, she has heard some, particularly in Ukraine, say that Western, especially US conservative evangelical Christians have been treating Eastern European countries as an anti-LGBT mission field. And she would appreciate learning about this uh, more. Uh, I think maybe uh, this is question about uh, as this, this question is about Ukraine. Maybe we start with Anna Maria and then we turn to Dorota. The role of uh, religious organizations in um, promoting anti-LGBT um, attitude is huge in Ukraine, and uh, um, uh, there is a, uh, there is an organization. Um, which unites, it is called the All Ukrainian Council of Churches, and it unites the representatives of the so called traditional religions in Ukraine, which include Protestant uh, representatives too. This is an organization which uh, um, works like a counseling um, group for Ukrainian government. And also, 
although uh, the state is divided from religion, according to Ukrainian legislation, they still have a have a huge voice, right? Because they uh, um, they appeal to this all sociological data and say that almost seventy percent of Ukrainian uh, population is religious. Therefore, we represent their. Um, interests in this case. And as far as I know, yes, Protestant organizations are one of the most um, active in uh, um, this uh, anti-LGBT movement, but uh, the Orthodox Church and uh, um, Greek Catholic Church is also taking its, um, making its contribution to all these uh, things. So, um, this is another topic of uh, discussion because uh, there were some research conducted recently in Ukraine about the anti-gender movement in general and the role of uh, this uh, council in uh, in uh, this uh, part in this part again. But we can argue whether this um, uh, wh whether this uh, organization has any influence on the majority of Ukrainian people and so on. But as we see from our research uh, from our interviews. Uh, the uh, the position or the attitude of the uh, of uh, a particular priest in a particular church, right? The the one that uh, we talk, uh, uh, our respondents say that it is very important. Uh, what is the position of the particular priest? Why? Because uh, not the whole church is seen by the parishers, right, to be the representative of. Um, of uh, uh, their beliefs, but they trust their priest, right? And they listen to what he says. And if he's uh, more tolerant about LGBT people, then the situation and is better for such people in this community. If he's uh, intolerant, then of course, um, people tend to withdraw from this religious community. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask Dorota, how much do you see this evangelical Christianism, uh, Christianity influential in Poland? Uh, I would later add some, <laughs> some thoughts from <laughs> Lithuania. <laughs> well, I, I mean, if there is an influence, perhaps there is, but it is very indirect. I mean, th there are no chances for any evangelical Christians to... to to speak loudly, loudly in Poland and, and be recognized as an important uh, group who has something important to say on an issue, because it would be considered a Christian minority and Christian minorities in, in the Roman Catholic Poland are, are not, not treated seriously. So as such, the, the, uh, the conservative evangelical Christians, uh, it, 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 uh, well, it's not that they come as missionaries or something and they can be like, uh, as I say, uh, taken seriously. But I think there is a lot of influence, actually, because because there are these transnational flows. Uh, and uh, but but the thing is that in Poland, they are sold as Roman Catholic. <laughs> so th th this was the case, for instance, with the reparative therapy, reparative therapy, like it's more related in the US, for instance, to the evangelicals, uh, these circles, I would say. But in Poland, it, 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 the, some circles within the, the Roman Catholic Church, they accepted these ideas, but they just presented it as, as, uh, as Roman Catholic, they never mentioned uh, evangelicals there. And it's the same now with the with the with the gender ideology. There are like these flows, and the, the gender ideology itself, it's for me, it's it's again connected so much to this anti-neoliberal issues, and it's not only church-related uh, or religion-related thing, but 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 it's again sold as uh, Roman Catholic in Poland, <laughs> and has huge support from uh, Catholic NGOs, for instance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dorota. I would very shortly uh, just also add that I think uh, in Lithuania we can see that uh, indirectly uh, the the trends uh, of anti-LGBT uh, Q uh, plus individuals and the organizations are reaching Lithuania uh, from United States, and uh, together I would say also with organizations in Poland. Uh, the, there are certain initiatives against LGBTQ plus individuals in the country, but they are not uh, uh, related to minority religion, but rather uh, find support within dominating Roman Catholic Church. 
I can see that our time is running out and I would like to invite now Amy to announce our next webinar. Thank you, Milda. So I'm going to put in the chat here um, a website for a project research project that is collaboratively being undertaken by a team of researchers. So Dr. Florence uh, Pache-Guinard was actually here for the beginning of today's webinar, but she had to leave. And she's the leader of this four person research team that has received funding from the American Academy of Religions uh, Collaborative International Research Grant. Along with her is working um, a scholar from the US, Pascal Engelmeyer, um, a scholar from India, Sucharita Sarkar, and a scholar from Italy, Giulia Pedrucci. And the four of them have approached us uh, with the idea of presenting their research project, which is titled Beyond Mother Goddesses, New Directions for International Scholarship on Motherhood in Religious Studies. So we're still negotiating about the date. Um, they had proposed February 25th, but uh, Milda and I are suggesting maybe a different date will work. Um, but we know that this will be our next webinar and that we will host it after the conclusion of the sort of broad holiday season. So you have that to look forward to. Um, you can see a little bit about their project um, using that link that's in the chat. Uh, and we look forward to hearing about a really rich, um, multi-institutional, multinational, collaborative international project at our next webinar. So we're really grateful to see many new faces um, today. We have grabbed your email addresses from the chat so that you will get a notice about the next webinar. We invite you to join our Facebook Facebook page um, for the Women Scholars Network, as this is the main place that we post information, whether it's job ads or grant opportunities um, and activities of the WSN. And I'll leave it to Milda to close us out. So thank you once again to everyone who contributed today to, to, uh, to this webinar with your questions, with your presentations. Thank you and see you uh, on the other occasions and have a nice evening or day wherever you are because thank we are you to our presenters once community. again thank you thank, thank you, you very much. much thank you thank you bye bye thanks a lot